Bobby Johnson. Well done, Manchester United. It's a sharing up. And so far, it's funny. Bobby Soft saved it. United again. Ready? Welcome to United Hour, your official Red Cafe podcast for all things Manchester United. I'm your host, Nick. And I'm Jimmy. And yeah, silence there. Normally we're expecting three or four <laughs> guys on today and there's only two of us. Uh, I don't know whether that's anything to do with the board draw we've got to talk about. There wasn't a great amount of talking points for our match today. We're actually recording on Sunday, so we've had uh, 24 hours to think about the nil-nil with Manchester City, even though there's very little to chat about. Uh, we will, of course, be covering that match, but uh, we're not going to focus on it too much just because there literally isn't a huge amount to say. Um, so, yeah, we are going to have a chat about a few other things that are relevant to it, like even though I want to avoid talking about him, we really can't avoid talking about Paul Pogba, who was back in the starting lineup. We'll have a little bit of chat about the Europa League because uh, we've got the draw tomorrow. But yeah, we're going to have a big focus on Ole's big game record because uh, now it's kind of four matches we've had against the top six this season and it was a big talking point last season where he actually had a pretty good record in some of the big matches. But yeah, it's something we want to go in depth on and then uh, we will, of course, cover the next couple of matches coming up. But yeah, look, like I said, Jamie, um, we normally try and talk, you know, quite in depth and analyse the games this one, you know, what is there to say? You know, like it was nil-nil, wasn't a huge amount of chances, not that many talking points. I mean, what, 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 what do you want to say what your thoughts from the game were? Uh, from a spectacle point of view, I thought it was an absolutely wretched game of football. Um, when we started, the game started off and both teams in the first five, ten minutes really took a, a long time in terms of the first quarter of an hour to even sort of calm down. There was a lot of nervousness, I thought, not just from United, but from City as well. There was possession being conceded cheaply by both teams. Um, I don't know, it was just it was a strange start in terms of just giving the ball away repeatedly, passes not going the right way. Um, and then it just settled into this rhythm where both teams just looked, too nervous to attack. Um, the amount of times, say for example, like Raheem Sterling got the ball on the left, and Wan Bissaka didn't have a, didn't have a great game at all, and, and, and made quite a few problems of his own making. There were sorry, quite a few problems of his own making, is what I wanted to say. In in terms of getting stuck under the ball, not reading the path of the ball correctly, and Sterling had so many opportunities to get the ball and just run at his man, and every time he would take. Two steps forward towards Wan Bissaka, stop, turn and pass the ball back. Ball goes into midfield, pings over to the other side. Rian Mares does the exact same thing, gets the ball, sorts of advance, sort of advances a wee bit, comes up against Luke Shaw, doesn't even take him on, turns inside, passes the ball back into midfield. The same, it was the same with us. Like the amount of times we got the ball and the defenders were passing it between themselves into the midfield with Fred and McTominay had nowhere to go in terms of nobody really breaking their neck to try and get in behind the City line or, or sort of show for the ball other than really Bruno. So then it was pinged around the midfield. It would go back to the defenders, then out to the wings, back into the midfield, and then eventually you lose the ball again. It was it was such a weird half. And I really expected at half time that we would have a bit more impetus in the second half in terms of maybe a substitution being made and Van de Beek coming on maybe or something like that. But the second half was just more of the same, quite frankly. It was it was a really dire game. Yeah, like I say, you know, if you look at the XG and stuff, there really just wasn't many chances over here. Actually put City slightly ahead of us, but really this was the kind of result that was deserved over here. I mean, uh, the main talking point, obviously pre-match especially, was Paul Pogba being back in the starting lineup. Uh, you know, there'd been a huge amount of chat about him because of the comments from uh, Mino Raiola in the week before. And he'd come on that midweek and done pretty well for kind of half an hour against Leipzig. I didn't actually expect him to start this game. So, yeah, to see him in there was a bit of a surprise to me. Uh, but then, yeah, there's then be a huge amount of focus, of course, on his kind of post-match where he's put out this statement on Instagram. 
Um, you know, everybody's questioning his loyalty at the moment, saying, you know, why isn't he saying anything when his agent's coming out saying he's not happy? We want to hear from Pogba. And then, so yeah, in case anyone hasn't seen it, this is the statement he puts out on Instagram. And this was after the game yesterday. He says, I've always fought and will always fight for Manchester United, my teammates and the fans. Blah, blah is not important. The future is far. Today is what matters. And I'm a thousand percent involved. Always strong together. All has been clear between the club and myself. And that will never change. When you don't know what's going on inside, don't talk. Speak the truth or remain silent. So, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, he normally doesn't come out with this kind of thing. So it was interesting to see him put out this statement. I mean, yeah, what do you make of that? In the first instance, in all honesty, I really struggle to find myself caring that he's even released a statement because everything around Pogba for probably not long after he signed has just been a total circus. And I'm now just at the point where I really can't be bothered with anything he says to try and excuse what his agent has said. I mean... We can look at it in two ways. So on Pogba's statement alone, I don't really care because I think he's been mediocre. I mean, I'm probably being quite kind, but he's been mediocre for me over the most part of his career. And I think that statement is just a long-winded way of him saying, I'll try hard, I'll work hard as long as I'm here. But beyond that, I'm looking to leave at the end of this season. He's saying the future this far, but I don't really believe that. I think he's just trying now to put out the fire that's been started last week and just saying, look, as long as I'm here, yeah, I'll work my backside off, I'll try hard, but beyond that, we'll see what happens. And I just think it's it must be a tactic now from the agent and the player where the agent comes out and says something that we know fine well is going to start an absolutely massive fire that everybody's going to have opinions on. I mean, before the Leipzig game, on Wednesday, there was about literally half an hour of Paul, uh, uh, Paul Scholes, Rio Ferdinand and Owen Hargreaves all discussing Paul, that, like, what Raiola had said. That was it. They weren't even talking about the build-up to the game, really. That, that was done in like 20 minutes. There was half an hour almost dedicated to them just talking about what Raiola had said. And I find myself, as I said, thinking that it's a tactic where he says this, knowing fine well, that everybody's then just going to lose their head and be like, right, nah, get rid of him, get rid of Pogba, stop dealing with this agent. We know Pogba probably does want to leave. I, I would be 95% certain on that. So what the agent must do is take all the heat, release a statement like that, knowing fine well, he'll get all the heat. And then later on in the week, Pogba comes out and says, look, as long as I'm here, I'll try my hardest. But everybody is now in total and utter 100% certainty on where each person stands. Raiola wants Pogba out. Pogba wants to leave, but he'll try as hard as he's here. We're now led to believe Man United have been trying to get rid of Pogba for 18 months, but they can't find a buyer. So as much as that statement is probably meant to try and calm the situation down, I don't really think it does anything other than confirm that either in January or in the summer, Pogba's, Pogba's leaving Man United. Yeah, and, you know, and a lot of people would have said he would have left last summer if it wasn't for kind of COVID times and the clubs who would usually probably be in for him not having enough money to go through with that. I think uh, that is definitely possible. And he's obviously made these comments himself whenever he goes out on international break. And that's annoyed me a lot. Uh, I mean, on these actual comments on Instagram, I actually, reading between the lines, think that Ole has said to Paul Pogba, right, if you want to play in this game, I'm expecting you to put out a public statement putting your support and back to this club because you know that's what everybody's been talking about saying how can he get away with this Fergie wouldn't have allowed it how can Ole allow and you know Ole's always been very positive about Pogba there's always been questions about it he's always said no listen he trains well and last you know last season remember when he was injured for ages and there was all this rumors coming out that he's feigning injury and stuff and you know yeah. I actually never believed that you know like I said I have a big issue myself with a lot of the poor Pogba circus but I never believed that he was feigning injury or st- anything like that um, and yeah all all the way through, Solskjaer did support him. 
So I think, you know, I've got no basis for it, but for him to be in the starting lineup here and then put out that statement, I'm pretty certain he said to him, listen, if you want to be back in this team, then I want to see a public show of support to this club from you. Uh, and, you know, there's other little things you see, like people pick out now that if you go to like Pogba's social medias, you barely even see Manchester United yeah, mentioned. that's true. He's often like wearing a France shirt. He talks about as if like, he, you know, Adidas, uh, who he plays for, uh, you know, and things like this. So, yeah, there is definitely. And I think probably in the background that we don't know about, there will already be talks going on between the club and his agent about his contract. There surely has been because he's getting to that point on his contract where the club will have definitely had some chat with the agent, either like, you know, move him on or this is what we're offering for renewal. We, you know, we don't know what kind of discussions been, but I'm sure there has been. And probably those talks have not gone that well or not gone that well for whatever Pogba and his side want, which is why they've been coming out with this kind of nonsense. Um, so, yeah, I'm sure that's it. I mean, I know we did actually have a question come in uh, to the podcast saying, you know, should United deal with Mino Rayola ever again. Uh, you know, what do you think about that? Um, Gary Neville, after the game last night, addressed that very question because he was absolutely slating Rayola for his attitude and, and for the way he's orchestrated this. And Mika Richards turned to him and said, uh, part one of a question, would you deal with him again in the future? And Neville said, absolutely not. Man United should stay well clear. Then Mika Richards followed it up and said, well, he's are interested in Haaland, and Haaland is a player that Man United absolutely should be interested in. So surely, if the club is interested in Haaland, that shows that they are prepared to deal with Raiola in the future. And Neville kind of was really quite forthright and turned around and said, absolutely, no way should the club be getting involved with Raiola again, irrespective of the player he represents. Because quite frankly, Raiola has just taken the piss right out of the club and has just shown the club a flagrant lack of respect. So after after we get rid of Pogba or whatever happens, United should just give the guy a very wide berth and just totally leave him alone. I totally agree with Neville. It should now be a point of principle that they just don't deal with Raiola. It doesn't matter if they represent if he represents Haaland or or whoever. Because I understand that he's doing what he thinks is best for his client. But you, to just show the club the total lack of respect that he has over the last, not just year, you can go back three years of this absolute nonsense where he's done this. I mean, I can't stand Raiola. I, I, I just can't stand him. To come out the day before the Leipzig game, which is the biggest game of our season so far at that point, and he comes out with that, there's just no getting away from it. It's just an absolute Yeah, and of disgrace. course, you know, we can go all the way back to uh, when Pogba first left the club. And even way back then, you know, Fergie had been critical of Raul all the way back then and said, listen, you know, this was one of the reasons that Pogba left. I didn't want him to leave, but he took on this new agent. And, you know, at that time, he wasn't that well known. And he was taking on a young players like Pogba who weren't like world stars or anything. Um and, you know, I actually spoke to an Italian mate of mine and he said, oh, we call him the pizza man in Italy because <laughs> he actually just like, that's what he used to be. He just ran like pizza restaurant or something oh, like that wow. and somehow ended up being a football agent. And he said in Italy, he's nicknamed the pizza man, basically. Do you think we should um, deal with him again? And like after all the Paul I wouldn't. stuff's done? I wouldn't. And I actually think that one of the reasons like that maybe we didn't end up getting a deal for Haaland is because the club already don't get on with his agent. And it must have already been an issue um, and because, you know, there was obviously interest from Ole towards Ireland and it didn't happen. And I'm pretty sure that clauses he wanted and wouldn't back down on were the big reason that this yeah, I agree. transfer didn't happen to us. But we have worked with him a lot. I mean, Jose in particular seemed to love like Riola because he bought in Zlatan, uh, Mkhitaryan, yeah. uh, even Lukaku is by him. And recently, I think Jesse Lingard went and signed up with him, but I don't know. I think he's, I think, I think there. he's dropped him now as an agent. But I had read that, but yeah, I don't know if that's official yet or what exactly. So yeah, he is an agent who's definitely been involved with the club. But like I said, Fergie had said years ago that listen, with this guy, we should not be dealing with him, and he was absolute nightmare, and that was why you know Pogba ended up leaving the club. And yeah, you know I'm on record on this podcast, and I was the only one at the time who didn't want Pogba coming back to the club. 
because of all that and the circus and things like that, even though, you know, I recognised at the time that he was a top player. I was against him coming in in the first place. Um, so, yeah, look, let's see what happens over here. I mean, I will actually give Pogba credit and say that I don't think this kind of stuff does affect how he plays on the pitch that much. Uh, because it's just, you know, kind of up and down anyway. Nothing to do with contracts and all. And there's even a little bit that you might say maybe he's even putting himself in the shop window now I would agree with to that. try and get a move. I think that's exactly what it is. It's, it's, it's to maximise the appeal, if that's the right word, of him as a player. Um, and if he now plays like this, to the, if he plays how he played, say, against Leipzig when he came on, the 20 minutes or so against West Ham, and I actually thought he played all right against Man City yesterday. If he, if he puts the effort and tries to the end of the season, fine. But I was at a point where I wouldn't I wouldn't have started him ever again, Pogba, because I can't I can't fathom that this happens so many times, where he constant the agent I mean constantly comes out. And makes statement after statement after statement that Pogba wants to leave. He's unhappy. He feels unloved. He feels that the fans don't give him any respect. Um, we've also had Pogba's brother come out in the past and say the exact same nonsense, wanting Pogba to be put in the best possible light and everything's Man United's fault. I mean, Brian like said it yesterday. It was like, you can't he just keep. Blame like Pogba and the and the agent cannot keep blaming Man United for Pogba failing at Man United. All right, there's there's fault on the manager's sides. Absolutely, there's fault on the club side. But for God's sake, the, the player needs to take a large amount of responsibility as well if he thinks that he's failing it, in terms of his career's failing at Man United. That's not just the fault of three different managers or whatever it is now. You, you can't just keep. Going back to that, you can't. There needs to be an acceptance of responsibility from Pogba that it hasn't worked out. And instead of just blaming everything else and every other circumstance around him, it's just not worked out because he hasn't done enough, the club hasn't done enough, the managers haven't done enough. It's not been a successful transfer. Okay, fine. At the end of this season, let's move him on and let's just get the next player in. Because I've just had enough. Yeah, I mean, I wonder even uh, if we even wait until the end of the season. I mean, yeah, we will talk about it in a little bit. Not just yet, but obviously, yeah, the January transfer window is opening in just a few weeks' time. Uh, and I know that's a favourite part of the year for you, oh, right? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. But yeah, so we will have a chat about that. But yeah, just going back to the game, like, um, so you said, yeah, you thought Pogba played pretty well. I did think the one thing of interest was the kind of formation. Um, there has been a lot of question marks recently about what formation Ole is playing and uh, there's been a few criticisms that he's been chopping and changing too much because, you know, just in the space of the last few weeks, we have seen the diamond. We saw three at the back. And then obviously we saw our more kind of what is usually Ole's system, which is 4-2-3-1. Uh, you know, when the lineup came out for the City game, I think most people said, oh, we're playing the diamond because it looked like that in the way it was because there was McTominay, Pogba and Fred and uh, Bruno. I think in the end, though, it actually played out more like our more natural 4-2-3-1 with Pogba playing kind of attacking left. Uh, Greenwood playing attacking right and Rashford up front and if you look at the average position charts it does that supports that that basically this was actually more like the natural 4-2-3-1 that we're normally playing and uh, you know we did actually have a question from uh, Cantona's collar who's uh, yeah always a good supporter of ours on Twitter talking about you know what is Ole's philosophy what is his best formation and these are questions that come up again and again and again and for me Ole does want to play 4-2-3-1 the only reason he's been moving away from that is because he didn't get a right-sided attacking play that he wanted and then we've also had a few injuries, like obviously Martial's been unavailable, Greenwood was injured at some point, Cavani was still coming in. So he's been kind of forced to maybe go towards this diamond and things like that. And I don't think he actually wants to do it. I think the, the formation he wants to really always play is this 4 2 3 1. And it is generally what he does play, apart from now and again. But uh, I do kind of agree with some people who say he's been chopping and changing too much. Uh, but yeah, Pogba was playing very much a more attacking role than he has done. And that's always been in his career. One of the biggest issues was is what is his best position? You know, we've seen him play 
Sometimes he's with number 10. Uh, this time he's playing more like left, like attacking mid. We've seen him play number eight, even sometimes dropping more into like number six. And I think that has been one of the biggest issues is what is his best position. And I don't know if you've ever had a kind of feeling on it. You know, we, I've chatted about this. I know Reese has big thoughts about this and why he doesn't play as well for us. And we'd went into it a couple of weeks ago after he'd had a couple of good games for France and all. Um, but yeah, I mean... Do you think that comes down to that, or is it more just Pogba's fault? If you were to ask me where should he be playing, yeah, it's it's definitely more of the left sided role. Going back to the game yesterday when the lineup was announced, um, the frustration for me over the last wee while has been the constant chopping and changing, not just of the system, but of the constant changes to the lineup. Um, I just think when you look at the best team, so Spurs at the top of the league, they're now alright, Liverpool have got injuries, but in general, the rule applies to them as well. When their team is announced, bar maybe one or two forced changes or to give players a rest, you know exactly who's going to be playing, you know the positions they're going to be playing in, and then they just go from there, and that consistency I mean, you can see it with Spurs. I know Kane's on fire and so Son, but the consistency of the selection and the formation that Spurs are playing has just got them into such a good rhythm and such a consistent rhythm. They're now managing to make an assault on the top of the league. Liverpool have done it for the last however long, 18 months, 24 months. Uh, City, yeah, they've not been great this season, but generally, you know, the system they're going to play, you know, most of the players that are going to play too often at the moment, I find United, you don't even know the system. You don't even know what a living's going to be playing. I mean, we are guessing even in our own individual chat, and you see it on Twitter, the amount of Man United fans that are guessing what the lineup's going to be, guessing what system we're going to be playing. And yeah, some of it's enforced because of injuries, but... Yeah, I was going to say that. I think we've had pretty unlucky timings with certain injuries that have really not made it possible for Ole to be sticking to a system and going with it week in, week out. Uh, you know, especially it kind of happened to us midweek against Leipzig where Cavani, Fred, Martial are all unavailable. Um, there is a bit more question mark over whether he should be sticking with just one formation because, as we said, he's definitely played at least three different ways this season and especially three different ways just in the space of the last kind of month or two. But generally, like I'd say, you know, 75, 80% of games, Ole is playing that 4 2 3 1 nowadays. I think it should be the 4 2 3 1 as well. Because when I saw the lineup, as I was saying, I, I did think it was going to be the diamond. I, I did think that was the way it was going to be just off of, this, off of the 11 when it was announced. But yeah, within 10 minutes of the game, I think you could see the basis of the team was the more 4 2 3 1 selection and Pogba does tend to play better on the left hand side and like I said I did think he had a decent game yesterday um, I was surprised that Van de Beek didn't get the nod um, but I can I can understand why the two in front of the back four that was selected was um, McTominay and Fred and by the way I thought they were both very good yesterday I thought Fred, I was worried after he got his knock and maybe the quarter of an hour mark that he maybe was going to have to go off but after that he recovered and I thought he played really well I thought McPominay was very good again yesterday as well um, so in general I thought the midfield were alright really and that four two three one should be just the go-to selection but as we kind of know the, the reason we struggle sometimes is just the fact we don't have a right-sided player and, and, and Greenwood is an excellent proposition and is a great finisher and probably will be centre forward before we know it but just we just see that we're lacking that right sided player which would just finish off the formation for me and um, I think the pro you're probably right in his philosophy is the four two three one. I would agree with that it's just we need to get the consistency of selection and we need to get that consistent run of the same formation going because the constant chopping and changing can't be helping the players either. Yeah, and as I say, though, I, I like I said, I think a lot of it has been enforced. And I do also remember that last season, everybody was complaining about him play, running players into the ground 
and just playing them too much and not changing it. And, you know, partly we said, look, he doesn't really have the squad to do it. Whereas now there is quite a lot of our bench is usually pretty strong. And we all thought we usually have two or three big players uh, who don't even make the bench. Like, you know, this weekend, the likes of Dan James, Tuan Zebi, who, all right, you know, aren't first teamers, but are definitely normally in and around the squad, didn't even make the bench. Um, so, yeah, there's definitely like quite a bit of depth now we have. And I do think that actually, for me, one of the things I wanted to see more from Ole was a squad management keeping people fresh because it has been a problem for us twice you know twice in two years we went on these big run of games like winning games and last season was the end of the season the season before it was when Ole first came in and both times we kind of just seemed to run out of steam because he was just playing the same team yeah. week after week and I actually wanted to see him progress and start doing a bit more rotation at the right times because you have to when you're playing week twice a week uh, you have to do it and players have to be kept fresh um, and you know maybe there's still some choices to me like I say a lot of it as well that we've had injuries and suspensions and stuff at the wrong time so um, that I'm not too sure about but on the formation I do agree that maybe especially in this last few weeks it's just been like literally like we've gone like three games and three different formations and I think that's not helped so yeah we'll see where we go from there but uh, you know, the the big kind of thing I do want to focus on now, I think after this City game, it's a good time to talk about it, is our <clears throat> big game record this season. Because, uh, yeah, it doesn't make kind of good reading, does it? I think you'd noted down the matches we've had. I mean, more or less, it's basically four games now. And they've all been at home, which is slightly bizarre. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, we obviously had that Spurs hammering at the start of the season. Um, you know, I still write off that first three matches of the season as being kind of blamed on as having no preseason and that kind of thing. But yeah, that was, of course, an embarrassing like loss over there. And then we had uh, nil-nil with Chelsea. Uh, One-nil, we went down to Arsenal and it was a similar-ish, very tight game. They get there one was nearly goal from a, no, a penalty. No, that game as well, to be honest. Well, yeah. exactly. And uh, there is also a question mark anyway. Is Arsenal actually a big game? Because, <laughs> uh, you know, see them lose to Burnley today and they're somewhere know, down that, at the bottom. That's what but... I will say, right? If, if we are bad... I don't even know what Arsenal are. And that winds me up even more that we lost that game. You know, Piers Morgan had put something out the other day after we go out. And he said something like, oh, you know, as bad as Arsenal are, at least we're not Manchester United or Barcelona. I was, I was like, like, are, are you, you actually joking? Have you, just, have you seen you, you lot in the league? Like, you're so terrible. I'd actually posted it on there after we posted that. I said, if you think, like, let's just look at the situation. We've just lost to the Champions League semi finalists. You're playing Dundalk <laughs> on Thursday. So, like, I think that says everything about wherever we're at and wherever you're at. But as I say, there is a question mark of whether Arsenal even deserve to be in that kind of big game list. But yeah, look, at the moment, we've got them there. And then, yeah, 0 0 against City. So there has been three performances that are very similar 0 0 Chelsea, 0 0 City, 1 0. It was a loss at the end to Arsenal. So, yeah, it's two draws draws two losses and uh, I think the biggest issue as well is that there's only one goal out of four matches and you know on their own like drawing it with Chelsea drawing with City they're not bad results you know like you know you don't have that much of an issue in drawing with the teams who are at the top of the table but there definitely is a bit of a problem when you say there's been one goal in four kind of matches of what you've called about our big games this season and uh, I know other people then start talking about that we had kind of you know three semi-final losses last season and the oldest big game record is coming into question and like you know ironically I'd say last season it was actually one of the things that saved him yeah, was agree. the big game record because when we were really not doing well he pulled out wins against Pep Guardiola twice and in fact is still the only Premier League manager to win home and away against Premier uh, Pep Guardiola in a season and he also had a win against Jose he also had wins against Lampard twice I think yeah, although yeah I mean we did eventually so, yeah, you know, it was actually one of the big things that I think actually saved him last season, whereas this year it's gone the other way. I mean, and I say it is a bit strange that all these four have been uh, at home and we will still play them away. And generally we have been away, uh, better away this season. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know. What Do you think it's something to worry about or is it something that, you know, we can just like, there's still obviously going to be the away matches and uh, still a few others to come at home with like Liverpool uh, yet to come. So, yeah, it can still be changed. But at the moment, it's not good reading when you look at that top six record, right? Oh, it's absolutely tragic, man. Um, I noted it down, as you said, like immediately after the game, that in the games against, all right, the Spurs game, 
I know what you're saying, it's the start of the season, but 6-1 against Spurs really, really is terrible. But then you draw 0-0 against Chelsea, 1-0 loss against Arsenal, 0-0 against City. To have only scored one goal in those four games against the other big six teams so far is bad in itself. But then when you factor in, that's a penalty against Spurs in a game that we've been beat heavily. It really isn't good enough at all. I mean, I understand, like, and I kind of said this before, that I understand that we got hammered by Spurs and that might come into the thinking a wee bit of the manager saying, right, yeah, okay, it was the start of the season that, but we don't want to get really exposed again and, and, and thumped out of sight. So let's make sure that, first of all, we're hard to beat and we try and keep the clean sheet as the most important thing and then go from there. But the the lack of threat from open play is is what blows my mind the most. I mean, I know yesterday we said, yeah, the, the XG kind of had both teams as, as the same where there wasn't many clear-cut chances. But To be fair, I should actually say that City did have a better XG than us in this game. Because, you know, I, I often point it out when we have a better XG. So for the sake of fairness, I'll say that, yeah, I think we're at something like 0.7 and they were at one point two or something like that. See, even that, like the chances were from up for our ones where Luke Shaw, which by the way, I will praise Shaw for his crossing in his corners yesterday. I thought they were excellent. But all of our threats were coming from corners. The corner that Lindelof flicks on that McTominay just misses at the far post then later in the That half, is at least positive, though, just to say, because, yeah, we have been... I've said more than once recently how awful our corners are, so I do think it's something that we definitely have been practising. So for the first time, we were actually winning a few headers and getting somewhere near getting a threat from a corner. So that was one good thing to see, at least in this game. That was a positive, but that was it. There, there was maybe one other... There was one chance in the first half where there was great football played by, like, four or five players when... Wambasaka and McTominay are more or less pinned into our defensive quarter and we play great football, get out of that, get it up to the midfield. Bruno misplaces the pass, but then we win it back. We square it again and we nearly score from that and we get a corner out of it. That, that honestly, and then other than the penalty that was ruled out for offside, I honestly can't name any other clear-cut chances from open play. Everything was set pieces, and I just feel that too many times in these big games, we, we aren't attacking anywhere near enough. We aren't looking to create any chances at all. It's too passive and reactionary and waiting for the other team to attack. I mean, City had two or three really good chances yesterday where there was the Mares one. I don't think Jesus is getting enough stick for his chance because Mares plays a great ball into him and he just fluffs it totally and puts it over the bar. There's then the one where De Gea makes a really good save from Mares, and then De Bruyne skies it over the bar and then there was another, I can't remember who it was in the second half but City then have another really good chance where the cut is open and just don't really do anything with the ball and the chance goes begging. But that's what I mean. You can still name three or four chances that City made by just playing good football, cutting his open and having the chance. We really lack that against any of the big teams and it's it's yeah worrying. the xg shows it as well you know like i said 0.6 you know showing that we didn't really deserve much i mean yeah the only slight talking point was the kind of rashford penalty non-penalty and i think it was the right call. yeah that's right, i mean yeah. what i think is happening basically in these games is that actually the likes of guardiola the likes of lampard have actually shown a lot of respect to the fact that ole beat them both twice last season and they've turned up at old trafford and played way more defensively than they usually would do. Uh, and, you know, Ole has shown in these games and the ways won basically all of them last season was on the counter, on the transition, hitting them on the break, and it worked really well. And they're scared of that now. And you don't see Manchester City playing as cautiously and conservatively as they did yesterday against us. They just never do. Like, that is about as cautious as you'll ever see a Pep Guardiola team come out. And it was similar when Chelsea came. Chelsea came to play for a draw at Old Trafford. They, like, set up completely for a draw and they got it. And I think that it's because, you know, Ole did them 
both of them twice last season that they've actually come and uh, set up. So yeah, I think there is then still criticism saying, look, there needs to be more focus on what we do to win the game. And yeah, definitely you can say that. But I do think that is what's the difference between last year and this year is that those managers are actually now a little bit scared of how Ole did them twice last year and have just sat very cautiously saying, we don't want to lose these games like we did last year. And they've come super defensively and we've not then done enough. That's what I was going to say though, right? That's fair enough about like Guardiola's came and and they're maybe a bit more restricted in terms of not going all out to try and win the game because they are scared of United on the counter and Lampard and Arteta have done the same. But do you not think then, because we are at home, that if they come to Old Trafford and sit up like that and then go and say, right, normally we'll go all out and try and beat you, but actually we're going to sit here and say to you, break us down. Do you not think that's then a mark against Solskjaer that in the game you can see we aren't creating anything because the other team, by equal measure, are not opening up whatsoever and aren't willing to even look like opening up. Surely it must be a mark against Solskjaer then that the only method we seem to have against the top six to, to... engineer any sort of chance or any sort of effort is to go on the front foot on the counter but rather than he just doesn't seem to make a change where we think right actually we've played 60 minutes here against Man City we're not really creating anything whatsoever City aren't opening up let's change something let's let's try and do something because surely the onus has to be on Man United the fact that we're at home the other team whether it's City, Chelsea, Sheffield United, whoever, they've come to us and set up defensively. Surely so, surely Solskjaer has to realise in-game, whether it's half-time or wait to the 60th minute mark, the other team just isn't opening up. It doesn't matter if it's Man City or Chelsea or whoever. Surely the onus needs to be on Man United and we need to change tactics. Well, no, I, do, I think it does make a big difference because if it is Sheffield United or Crystal Palace, then for oh, sure... Yeah, I, I, there is, I understand you have that, to. but what I'm saying is if... Their entire game plan, Man City, has been, right, we're just going to be really hard to beat here and we're not going to give up any easy chances. But if we've set up at the start by equal measure thinking they're going to come here, play all the football, and we're just going to hit them on the counter, if it turns out after 45 minutes that's not happening, surely Solskjaer has to react in-game and do something that makes us take the initiative a bit more and try. But yeah, you, yeah, but you can do that and then you actually end up giving the opening well, yeah, to that, the other team. That, that's the risk, but, but I would rather see him try sometimes and take a risk like that than just, we end up just playing out a bore nil-nil draw. As you said, it's happened twice. Well, I don't know. If we end up losing this game, then yeah, you see like what the fallout is going to be from that. But I kind of get what you, but at the same time, like I don't, it's not a bad result to draw with Manchester City. It's not a bad result to draw with Chelsea. And, Last season, we actually won these matches. And as I say, it was kind of part of the thing that actually saved Ole's job in the end. But last season, we had a big struggle in breaking down the smaller teams where he's actually been a lot better at that this season. We generally had a really good record in those smaller matches. There is still this myth I keep seeing people talk about that Ole cannot break down small teams. And it's actually nonsense because like for most of 2020, we've beaten all the smaller teams. Of course, there's been the odd match where it's not happened, whether it's Palace and whatever. But this year, it's actually not been that way at all. It's something that was kind of happening last year, but it's been we've been a lot better at especially since Bruno came in. Um, I think if you draw these matches, it's not the end of the world. And like, we still got to play these teams again yet. And as long as we're winning the smaller matches, it's not a problem to me, to be honest. Uh, It is disappointing though, like you say, to not have many chances and four matches, like you say, one goal. And especially that it's a penalty. It's very difficult to like, uh, you know, not criticise. That's the biggest one for me. As I said, more than anything, I I understand I understand drawing games. I get that. I totally get that. But to, to only score a penalty, I get in those four games, and it comes in a six-one defeat. That's very very hard to not criticise. As you say, I think that start alone is open to a lot of criticism, and a lot of criticism does need to be put not just to Ollie but the players as well. That look, come on, you have to be doing more. Against these teams, if you draw, if you draw one, one or two, two, fine. As you say, we could beat one 0 by Arsenal. Rule that penalty out, and then it would have been three nil nils at home to all to three of the big four that we've played so far. 
And I just can't accept that we just, most of these games, we just aren't going to look at all like attacking them. I just, I, I can't accept but to that. To me, it's not a major issue as long as we win the other matches. I mean, you know, Fergie actually never had a particularly good big game record, but he beat all the crap teams week in, week out. We often lost like games to Liverpool, even Manchester derbies when they were way below us. But it didn't really matter because he won all the other matches. Uh, and, you know, at the moment, people, after that match, people said, oh, we're going to lose ground this week by only getting one point here because Tottenham, uh, got Chelsea have all got easy matches. Yeah. But in the end, Chelsea have lost. Uh, Spurs have only managed a draw. Arsenal have and lost. Arsenal have lost. I mean, like I said, <laughs> I'm not even too worried about They're Arsenal. They're bottom of the table, yeah. Uh, but never mind. So, you know, we're actually made up ground on them. And if we, again, we win our game in hand, we like actually going ahead Chelsea and sat in the top four. So Yeah, hindsight, hindsight being 2020, it's, it's actually isn't a bad point because as you say, all the teams that were around us and above us, apart from Southampton, I think, have drawn or lost their games. So, yeah, retrospectively, it's not a bad point. And it wasn't it, I, it wasn't really giving up ground that was the issue for me. It was just, I was just getting, Scottish people like to use a word called scunnered to be showing how fed up you are. And that is exactly how I was feeling at times watching Man United against big teams in the league. Just accepting before the game that, yeah, we're not really going to make many chances here. Um, we'll probably get one or two, maybe. We'll need to defend well to keep the other team out. And it'll just it'll just peter out in a, a boring game. And that's that's just what's happening at the moment in these big games. We might be better away from home because our away from home record is excellent at the moment. So, yeah, we might end up going away to these teams and, and playing much better. But I just think the home form has to improve. I mean, I checked Yeah, yesterday. the big thing as well not to forget is, you know, that I do think there is a big effect in these matches from there being no fans in the stadium, OK? Like, I think when there's fans there, then I think there is more impetus, like you say, on the manager to satisfy them. Because if there was a whole crowd there, there would start being chants of attack, 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 and there might start being some disgruntled kind of moans that, listen, we barely had a shot on target in this match. Whereas, uh, you know, you can get away with it a lot more easy when there is nobody there. Uh, and, you know, like, you know, ironically, the last game where there was fans at Old Trafford was all, there was the Manchester derby. It was this equivalent fixture last season back in March that was the last time we had a full Old Trafford. And, uh, you know, I remember being there for that. And uh, that was the game where we beat City again. Was, there was that McTominay last minute long range goal uh, that sealed it for us that day. And, yeah, it was a great performance. And uh, you know, as I say, was those kind of games that actually probably saved Ole's job last season when things weren't going that well. Uh, so, you know, it's a total contrast in how these matches are being played out. And I do think the lack of fans makes that big difference. Uh, you know, interestingly, actually, there is now possibly... Uh, it'll be not. It'll be Leeds United, which is not our next game, but the game after, which might have fans back at Old Trafford for the first time. Season ticket holders now can actually apply to go back to Old Trafford, but it does depend on Manchester being changed from Tier 3 coronavirus to Tier 2, which may happen on Wednesday, so we have to wait and see. But yeah, applications are open at the moment, so we may see your fans back at Old Trafford as soon as this uh, coming weekend, possibly. Uh, so yeah, it will be a good step in the right direction, at least. If it's the Leeds game, to welcome fans back. That would be excellent. That's first penciled in for it but as I say it all depends on what Boris uh, <laughs> yeah. decides on Wednesday with tears and things like that and uh, we'll see what goes on over there um, but yeah look I say I do understand like this big game record now did that that start of like one goal and it being a penalty in a loss in four matches you're right it's very difficult to like not let, cause some problem with that but at the same time as I say two draws against City and Chelsea to me is not a major issue um, it's the, I said at the time that that loss to Arsenal was the one that actually hurt yeah, me the most the whole season yeah. <clears throat> the timing of it uh, how we played everything um, but yeah look you know we've come back and at least won some of these other matches like whether it's Southampton West West Ham are actually both still running pretty high and maybe have more more uh, argument to be top six at the moment than Arsenal do. <laughs> um, and yeah, we did manage to get a result against them at least. But yeah, it will be. We'll monitor this and see how we go. I mean, um, 
I don't know what our next uh, top six games are, actually. But, yeah, they'll be coming up soon. And, yeah, we'll keep a monitor on it. And, yeah, if we want to finish top four, if, you know, some people are still saying Look, we're in with a title challenge, then you do have to win some of those matches for sure, especially when we've lost two of them already. When we go back away, there's going to have to be some results coming there. So we'll see. We'll see. Um, but yeah, look, let's have a quick touch then. As I say, in a couple of weeks' time, the January window is open. We talk a bit about Pogba. We, well, I mean, like I said, I think we've all made pretty clear. I think the holes on our squad are apparent. And as I said, I think what Ole wants to be doing with this squad, he has been hampered by not having bought in that right-sided player that obviously all summer we talked about Sancho. Uh, I mean, I still always thought we needed a centre-back as well. And I still think it is a weakness. I'm still not convinced always by Lindelof, although he's definitely been playing better than he was earlier in the season. Uh, it was interesting that I, Eric Bailly was back on the bench for this match. Uh, I have actually been really disappointed that we haven't seen more of Axel Tuanzebi yeah, this so season. Much. He was one that, you know, I was really looking forward to getting fit. He had that great match at PSG. He then had that one terrible game. I forget now which one was it where he got substituted after he had a bit of a nightmare. I think it was the, um, was that the Basak Shahir game? Are we, are we yeah, in think, yeah, may have been. It was definitely there was yeah there was that game he got substituted and he's never really reappeared after that. I mean I said I was surprised midweek that he didn't play in the three man ahead of Shaw. And then he wasn't even on the bench this weekend. So that has been a massive disappointment for me because uh, I was hoping he might be the one who comes in and saves us from having to buy a centre-back. But if Ole's not convinced by him for whatever reason, then yeah, those are the two areas for me that we might look at in January. Although, to be honest, I'm not expecting any transfers. Uh, I mean, I know you love following the transfer rumour mill and all. So do you think they'll, that we'll be doing much business in this winter window? No, I am a transfer muppet, absolutely, and I love all the chat, and I love keeping up to track with all the rumours and what have you, but no. Um, I thought we needed a lot more than what we got in terms of numbers and experience and for the immediate term in the summer, and the fact that we didn't get the recruitments I thought we needed in the summer means that I'm not expecting anything in January whatsoever. I think there's been murmurings around the club in terms of finances. Uh, you know, when you have Edward on talking in his quarterly meetings or whatever they are, and I just get the impression that, no, there isn't going to be a massive amount of money spent in January, if any at all. And I think we can probably expect our next recruitments to be next summer. Um, I'm excited to see the Diallo kid come in in January, just mm. uh, but I'm not expecting him to be near the team immediately or anything like that. Uh, but it will be exciting to see how he gets on in the reserves. But I'm expecting anything, no. But if you could say to me, right, you can pick exactly the position you need, I agree. I think centre-half is an absolute must. I am surprised Twan Zabi hasn't had more appearances this season so far, because I thought he was excellent, as you say, against Paris Saint-Germain. Yeah, okay, he had a bit of a nightmare against Basak Shahir, but I still thought he would have got his chance in more games. I did think he would have started against Leipzig as well. I was surprised he wasn't on the bench yesterday. There's been other games as well that he's he's not made the squad, and I, I just find it a bit strange. He's, he just seems to be nowhere near in certain match days. Um so I'm disappointed with that. Yeah, I guess the absolute perfect scenario for us would be uh, sell Pogba and spend that money on bringing in Sancho, right? That'd be surely like your, your dream, your dream for this window. That would be, <laughs> and, it would be uh, absolutely but, yeah. amazing. But uh, I mean, I do. Uh, right wing is is still just such a problem area for me. Um, but. Uh, well, that, yeah, it is interesting that this Diallo is going to be coming in. And, yeah, there's been a lot of these YouTube videos, but not much. Like, he's not played much even for Atlanta where he's over that. But, yeah, one one thing I do want to mention, though, is that Facundo Palestri has been doing really well in the reserves. Like, in today they've played and he's scored for his third reserve game in the row. He had an, a decent assist earlier in the season as well. I think he's only played about six games and he's got three goals and an assist so far. And he is a right winger. And I didn't expect to see any of him 
this season, but maybe he's actually ahead uh, of settling in a development that we might have expected and possibly it wouldn't be that much of a shock to start seeing him in and around the squad. Uh, I think, yeah, maybe whenever we've got we've got a League Cup game coming, not League Cup, but even the FA Cup game maybe might be the right time to see somebody like that. Uh, I think it's not till the new year, but something like that might be the time. That, as I say, I know there's been a lot of focus on Diallo because we spent a lot more money on bringing him in. But in fact, Palestri, because he's already at the club, he's already settled a little bit. I think there might actually be more chance of us seeing him come in and maybe get a chance to have a go at that right wing, seeing as we don't have any other natural player to play over there. Um, I, I, we, we'll probably see some outgoings. Like I can't believe that the likes of Sergio Romero and Marcus Rojo are still going to be sitting around for another six months doing absolutely nothing. Uh, surely somebody somewhere can take these players off our hands. I think the way, just because you said his name there, Romero, I think the way we've dealt with with Romero has been disgraceful to say the least because he's been the consummate professional for us in terms of when when he's brought in and then when he's been left out, there's been never been any complaints. He's just got on with it. He's always been really solid when he's came in and performed well and, and the how he played in I think it was the Europa League run where we won the Europa League. He he performed really well that season. Um and to not help him out in terms of you know, just just at the end I think it was in the summer I think it was his wife had her say on social media saying, you know, the way the club had treated him was a disgrace. And you couldn't help but agree because bringing Henderson back, it was clear Henderson was going to be, at the very least, number two, if not challenging for the number one role. So just keeping him on and, and forcing him to stay there, I just thought was absolutely miles out. And the club really... Yeah, and I think we did talk about yeah. all that So, so I, I would like I would like to see him get his move just purely... Because he deserves it, he just deserves a chance to go and get a move somewhere, whether it's to the MLS or somewhere else in Europe, to go and keep playing. Rojo, I think we're going to need to pay someone to take him because I just can't, I can't, I can't see anyone taking him just because of the wages he's probably on until his contract expires. But yeah, there might be more outgoings, but in terms of incomings, I'm really not expecting anything. You mentioned the Europa League there. Uh, we do actually have the Europa League draw tomorrow because we're recording whoop, whoop. this on Sunday. We don't really want to be in it, but we are. I mean, yeah, we did also have a question come in from the listeners saying, you know, should we be, is the Europa League something we're going to have to focus on or just, should we just play the kids and forget it? I mean, I think the one kind of good thing about the Europa is that it's not actually restarting until the middle of February. So it's two months away yet. Uh, so we don't really need to be thinking too much about it. And by then, we're going to be a lot clearer about where we are in the yeah. league. Are we easy top four? Are we fighting for it? Are we maybe even going for a title challenge? And at that point, I think we can decide. That's the one good thing that there's two months now to decide on that uh, we are going to be seeded in this draw so we, we will avoid any of the kind of bigger teams there's still a few potential banana skins in there i was looking down the list of teams we might play and the likes that we probably want to avoid is somebody like benfica there's real sociedad in there who've been riding pretty yeah, high this year Apart from that, there's the odd kind of ones like Dynamo Kiev. You know, you don't like going out to Kiev in the middle of winter, um, the, you know, just from pure travel perspective. But yeah, otherwise, there's mostly teams that we should be beating even with a fair bit of rotation. And then the one other name that stands out on the list is there is Mulder in there. That would be a great story, I guess, for Ole oh, to be yeah, drawn back against good, his yeah. uh, club over there. So, yeah, we'll see what we comes out there. As I say, the draw, by the time this podcast comes out, we'll probably already know who we're actually playing. So there isn't a great deal to talk about. Um, so, yeah, we'll see from there. I mean, for you, is there, I mean, the Europa something you'd like to win or you're not too bothered about it and think we should just play the kids and forget about it? Um, normally, I would fancy having a crack at it. But, yeah, this season, I'm really not fussed about it at all. I was really excited about being back in the Champions League again, so I'm really disappointed to have went out in the manner that we have. And I did actually think when it was obvious and that like, was a game that we were going to be going into the Europa League, I actually wished that there were circumstances in which we could have finished bottom and not be in it at all. Uh, I think it's just a very draining competition. Um, if we make the quarterfinals then I probably would be a bit more bothered about it and I would reevaluate my position. But in February, when we're in the last 32 or whatever it is, I would definitely be playing 
the fringe players, the reserves, some of the young boys. Uh, you mentioned Palestri, yeah, he's he's had a really good recent run of games, and I would probably like to see the likes of him be in those games to get my run out against some good sides, but at this point in time, no, I'm really not bothered about it at all. I would just give the young guys and the reserves the run out. Yeah, as I say, because it's two months away, even though the draw's tomorrow, uh, we'll obviously chat about a bit there, and then it all depends on our league position at the time. You know, there was that season where uh, we ended up coming, was it, yeah, uh, Mourinho basically just gave up on yeah. the league and focused on the Europa League that year. And, you know, if you could actually, rather than come fourth, you'd probably prefer to win the Europa League, to win a trophy and you get that Champions League place. But, yeah, it's not really a decision we can be making at this time. And, yeah, I still don't see any reason why we can't be in and around making a title challenge. Uh, You know, as I say, people still talking about Ole out, which is bizarre to me uh, at times when we're, like, potentially two points off the top of the league. But everything is very bunched up. And as we get into New Year, we can start having more clear chats about that. We'll see where we're at. We'll see where we're at. And as I say, this kind of Christmas period is going to be quite crazy for us recording as well. I don't know how we're going to manage to get a podcast out about every game. I think it probably won't happen, but we will try and do what we can. We are also planning to do a kind of two-year review of Ole's time because it's just coming up to that period. Uh, Mourinho went just before Christmas two years ago. So Ole's just coming up to his two-year anniversary now. So yeah, at some point we're going to try and look back over the whole two years because sometimes, you know, you just focus too much on what's going on now and you don't get that full perspective on it all. And yeah, a lot has happened in this two years. Uh, but yeah, you know, before we finish off today, let's look ahead to the next game, which is Sheffield United. Uh, they're an absolute awful run of form this season. You know, after having an amazing season last year and really being very unlucky to miss out on qualifying through Europa League themselves. They only had a slight drop off at the end of the season. Otherwise, they were up there all year. Uh, you know, it was quite strange because it was based on an amazing defence last year. I think everybody had like one or two Sheffield United defenders in their fantasy teams. And uh, they were struggling from goals all year. They were just managing to nick the odd goal and get a clean sheet. Whereas this year, this still struggling for goals and the clean sheets have gone out the window I mean there really cannot be any excuse apart from winning this quite easily right we don't even want to expect the kind of typical go behind and come back again which has been our uh, mantra recently I mean yeah they've only got one point can barely buy a goal I mean in this game there's not even anything to talk about apart from just going for a routine win Absolutely right, right. Uh, they're in really wretched form and uh, earlier on, I managed to catch some of the Southampton game, and while Southampton were excellent and played very well, so Sheffield United really are shocking. Uh, some of the stats so far, so they've got one point all season at this point, and at the start of the Arsenal game, themselves and Burnley were the lowest scorers across all four divisions in England. Burnley won the Arsenal game, so that means Sheffield United actually have that honour all to themselves, the lowest scorers in all four divisions. So I think that means they're absolutely nailed on to score against us. Uh, But seriously, we can't be expecting or looking at anything other than three points from this game. They've got the third worst defensive record in the league, and at home this season they've had one draw. That's the one point they've got and five losses. And combined with the fact that we're really good away from home at the moment, I'm expecting absolutely nothing other than a convincing win. We, As you said, we can't even go behind this game. It would be unacceptable for the form that Sheffield United are in. Totally. Uh, and then, yeah, after that, uh, we've got Leeds United. I'm looking forward to that, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, you know... For- for me, growing up, uh, going to Old Trafford, Leeds was one of the big games of the season. Liverpool and Leeds were actually the biggest two games because at those times, City were pretty shit, basically. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you'd still had like a bit of bragging rights over the Manchester derby. But I'd actually say that, yeah, Liverpool and Leeds United were the kind of two games in which the most the fans kind of look forward to back then. And we've, I, I've missed this game. And it's a, all right, I'll say there will be some fans possibly back at Old Trafford but it's not going to be what we wanted and yeah this was one of the things that I was hoping to get back to you know when Leeds got relegated those years ago it was hilarious <laughs> and of course laughed and enjoyed it for many years but after about kind of 10 years of laughing at them I was actually like you know I actually missed that match and like so I'd actually like I'm, so I was kind of glad when they came back and especially with Bielsa who you know is a big kind of legend to me uh, you know my Spanish team is Athletic Bilbao and he was over there for a while and he's done good jobs over 
over there. Uh, so yeah, I was kind of really looking forward to that matchup. But uh, as I say, if there is any fans there, it's going to be maximum kind of 2,000. So yeah, it's not going to be anything like the atmosphere we might ever want. But I think... Um, Leeds have been a bit of a funny team this year. Like They're actually getting a load of credit about how they play and Bielsa's style, but they've actually been losing most of their matches and not actually doing that well. Uh, you know, they had some great performances where everybody gives them like plaudits where, you know, they went down 4-3 to Liverpool, but at the end of the day, they lost that game. Uh, so again, like it's something that we should be looking for a win, but, uh, you know, the tactical side when you go against somebody like Bielsa will be very interesting to check out. Um, yeah, you know, I'm looking forward to see how they come there and uh, Bamford's been in damn good form for them after you know having several clubs after leaving Chelsea he's finally like uh, hit some form for Leeds over there so yeah as I said on the tactical side I'm looking forward to it but yeah again I think yeah it's a game that we really should be I winning. I think so as well because um, as you say the, the form's been been kind of weird um, some of the some of the stats that stand out for them is they've actually scored the same amount of goals as Man City this season which is pretty impressive, but they've conceded 22 goals, which is the joint second worst in the league. And out of their last five, they've lost three, drew one and won one. So the form is up and down. And while it is fantastic to have another rivalry in the league, and even growing up, I remember the absolutely massive Man United Leeds games. And it has been disappointing that for a long time, that rivalry hasn't been there, so it's exciting to have it come back. And yeah, it would be excellent for fans to be back at that game, even if it is only a few thousand. But from a purely um, point of view of should we be winning the game, I absolutely think, yeah, we should be winning the game because it, they're not in great form themselves. And I think we should be looking to take maximum points from that as well. Yeah, so look, like I say, we, there's a chance we might record after Sheffield United. As I say, at the moment, with the hectic schedule, uh, it's difficult for us to record after every game. But yeah, I do hope our listeners out there have appreciated that we're putting out a lot more output. I'm going to just give a mention again to our Patreon. Uh, yeah, thanks to the guys who are supporting us on there. We are going to be starting now a kind of match day chat uh, on Discord, which is going to be kicking in. Uh, so, yeah, our supporters on there will be sending you an invite to that. And uh, anybody else, like I say, you're missing out on the entertainment like of Jamie <laughs> over here. Likes to have a good moan during the matches for sure. So, yeah, to hear that live uh, is well worth paying for. And, uh, yeah, we will be putting out as well, like I say, some kind of Patreon exclusive content over the next month or so. Uh, you know, we're looking at a few different special features to do and uh, fans who've been listening for a while will remember we've done like trips down memory lane where we talked about our favorite players our favorite matches we did also focus on like some old united legends that some people might not know that much about like the likes of robson and Cantona. and yeah we're going to be trying to do a few more of these features that we'll put out exclusively on patreon over there so yeah please do check us out it's a uh, you know just search for united hour on patreon even yeah as little as a kind of one pound a month will help us for helping our kind of paying our hosting and bandwidth costs uh, so yeah I'll put the begging bowl back away there but uh, yeah look as I said the match this week wasn't that much to talk about but I think we still had as usual plenty to chat about uh, you know I was always like having a, a chin wag on it like I say I think we had a comment from somebody saying oh it just sounds like some mates having a pint in the pub and chatting United and yeah that's what it always feels like to me just that's you why know, I enjoy having it, a chat to other United that's fans it. that's it you know even when we lose we often say right actually makes us feel better to just get it out there Definitely. Uh, rather than stewing over it uh, so yeah as I say another good chat over there uh, yeah, let's see I'm not, I won't guarantee that we'll be back after Sheffield United but we'll definitely be back after that lead game and yeah I think that's it for now we'll see you on the next one good night troops <laughs>